When a rope, chain, or cable is supported only at its ends, the shape of the curve it assumes under its own weight is called a catenary. Probably the most common example of a catenary that you see every day is a power line like this. Let's see if we can find the mathematical formula for a catenary using this power line. I will assume the viewer has a basic understanding of vector calculus. We're going to start by taking the lowest point on the curve, the vertex, and placing it on the y-axis where x is equal to zero. Then we'll pick another point somewhere else on the curve, anywhere, and we'll call that point x1. We can now focus on the section of the curve between these two points. At any given moment, this piece of cable has three directional forces acting on it. At the vertex, there's a horizontal force pulling this end of the section, keeping the cable suspended. Let's call this vector h. At the other end, at x1, there's a tangent force pulling the cable diagonally. Let's call this one t. And because of gravity, there's a vertical force acting on the whole thing, trying to pull it to the ground, but it can't succeed because the other forces are essentially canceling it out. These three vectors are playing tug of war, but none of them are winning. If they were, then the cable would be moving in the direction of that vector. We can express the state of equilibrium mathematically by saying vector h plus vector v plus vector t equals zero. Starting with h, let's describe these vectors by their orthogonal components x and y. This will be easy with h because it's horizontal, therefore all of its magnitude is in its x component. It's pulling to the left, so we know it'll be negative, but we don't know the exact value. We just know it's some constant. So since it's a component of the horizontal vector, let's call it little h. Again, all of this vector's magnitude is in its x component. It has no pull in the vertical direction. Therefore, its y component will be zero. Vector v, on the other hand, is vertical, so all of its magnitude is in the vertical direction and its x component is zero. It's pulling down, so it'll have a negative y value, and the amount of force pulling it down is simply equal to its mass. Since mass is length times mass per unit length, or density, we can say the mass of this cable is its length times its density, LD. Vector t is not orthogonal like the other two, but we can find its individual components by constructing a right triangle at x1 and calling the appropriate sides x and y. The hypotenuse of this triangle is the actual magnitude of vector t, so let's call it little t. And we can call the angle at x1 theta. So the cosine of theta is its adjacent side over the hypotenuse, x over t. Multiplying both sides by t gives us the x component of this vector. The sine of theta, which is the opposite over the hypotenuse, is y over t. Again, if we multiply both sides by t, we get the y component. Remember, the sum of these three vectors is zero. This means if we add them together in their component forms, we should get a zero vector as the sum. Let's add the x components first. Negative h plus zero plus t cosine theta equals zero. This simplifies to h equals t cosine theta. If we add the y components, we get zero minus ld plus t sine theta equals zero. This simplifies to ld equals t sine theta. So if these two equations are true, then we should be able to divide their respective sides and get a third equation that's also true. So let's do that. Starting with the left side, the t's will cancel out. That leaves us with sine over cosine, which is tangent by definition. The slope of the tangent at x1, or any point on the curve, is the derivative dy dx. For the right side, let's focus on d and h. These are just two constants that do not depend on the length of the section of the cable or the location of x1. So to simplify, we can substitute d over h with a new constant, a. The length of this piece of cable is not a fixed value. It does depend solely on where we place x. We can say it's a function of x, 
and we can write this function using the arc length formula from calculus. In this case, we're going from 0 to x, so those will be our limits of integration. This gives us a differential equation that describes the shape of the power line. To solve it, we are first going to take the second derivative. Differentiating will essentially cancel out the integral, thanks to the fundamental theorem of calculus. Now if we let the first derivative, dy dx, equal z, then the second derivative will equal dz dx. Substituting these in will simplify the differential equation, and leave us with something that's much easier to solve. We can start by separating the variables and integrating both sides. For the right side, the antiderivative of the constant a is ax. And we shouldn't forget about the arbitrary constant of integration c. Integrating the other side is not as easy. We'll have to use trigonometric substitution. Specifically, we'll use the Pythagorean trig identity tangent squared plus 1 equals secant squared. If we substitute tangent with z, we get what's under the radical in our denominator, which we can replace with secant squared. Since we substituted tangent with z, that means dz must be the derivative of tangent, which is secant squared theta d theta. This gives us a new differential. Now if we simplify, we end up with just the secant of theta. The antiderivative of secant is a common one that you may have memorized, or you can find it on just about any integration table. But I'll show you how to work it out either way. First of all, secant is just the reciprocal of cosine. Now if we multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by another cosine, we get cosine over cosine squared. Then we can use another trig identity. Sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. Subtracting both sides of this identity by sine squared gives us another substitution for the denominator. Now if we let u equal sine theta and plug that in, then du will be the derivative of sine, which is cosine theta d theta. This gives us another substitution for the differential. To integrate this fraction, we want to decompose it into two simpler fractions using partial fraction decomposition. To do this, we'll first factor the denominator. 1 minus u squared is a difference of squares, so it'll factor into 1 minus u times 1 plus u. We know this fraction can be written as two smaller fractions with these factors as their respective denominators. Multiplying both sides of this equation by the lowest common denominator will give us this. Let's split this into two separate equations. In one of them, we'll set u equal to 1. When we simplify, b gets multiplied by a 0, so it cancels out. If we solve for a, we get the numerator of our first fraction. In the other equation, we'll set u equal to negative 1. In this case, when we simplify, the a gets multiplied by a 0, so it cancels out. Solving for b gives us the numerator of the second fraction. Now we have decomposed this fraction into two simpler fractions that are much easier to work with. We can integrate the sum of these two fractions separately. First let's pull the one half out of each one, and then factor it all the way out. We can then multiply it over to the other side, and if we distribute, the 2 will be absorbed by the arbitrary constant c. Now let's focus on these two integrals separately, starting with the first one. If we let r equal the denominator 1 minus u, then dr will equal negative du. The antiderivative of the reciprocal function is the natural logarithm, so we have negative ln of r. Replacing the r with 1 minus u gives us the first antiderivative. For the second one, we can substitute r for 1 plus u. Then dr will just be du. Again, this is the antiderivative of the reciprocal function, which is the natural log of r.
Replace the R with 1 plus U, and now we have the second antiderivative. This is a difference between two logarithms, which we can write as a single logarithm of the quotient 1 plus U over 1 minus U. Remember, U is equal to sine theta, so let's replace that now. Now let's multiply the top and bottom of this fraction by the conjugate of the denominator, which will be 1 plus sine theta. Then we can simplify. For the denominator, we can use the Pythagorean trig identity from earlier. 1 minus sine squared equals cosine squared. Now both the numerator and denominator are being squared separately, so we can write this as one whole fraction raised to the second power. This fraction can then be broken down into two separate fractions with the same denominator. 1 over cosine is the definition of secant, and sine over cosine is the definition of tangent. Earlier, we set tangent equal to z, so we can go ahead and replace that now. To know what secant is, we'll have to construct another right triangle with interior angle theta. We know the tangent of theta is z, or z over 1. Since tangent is the opposite side over the adjacent side, we can label the appropriate sides of this triangle z and 1. We can then use the Pythagorean theorem to find that the hypotenuse is the square root of z squared plus 1. The secant of theta is the hypotenuse over the adjacent. In this case, the adjacent side is 1, so the secant will just be the square root of z squared plus 1, which we can plug into the equation. Remember that z is the derivative dy dx, and the derivative of this curve at the vertex is 0 because it's horizontal. So when x is 0, the derivative is 0. We can use this to solve for c by plugging in 0 for x and z. This simplifies to the ln of 1, which is 0. So c is 0. Therefore, we can get rid of it. This is a natural logarithmic equation, and the base of the natural logarithm is the natural constant e. So we can rewrite this as a power of e. Then take the square root of both sides and simplify. Subtracting z and then re-squaring both sides, this allows us to expand the left side by foiling. And on the right side, the square power will cancel out the square root. We now have a z squared on both sides, which cancels out. Now solve for z and simplify. Since z is the derivative dy dx, let's go ahead and replace it. Now we have a much simpler differential equation than we had at the beginning. This one can be solved by separating the variables and integrating both sides. On the left side, the antiderivative of dy is just y. Then we can multiply the 1 half over to the other side to give us 2y. On the right side, we can separate this into two separate antiderivatives. Let's look at the first one. Substituting u for ax means du will equal a dx. Therefore, dx will be du over a. Plug these in, then factor out the 1 over a. The antiderivative of the exponential function e to the u is e to the u. We can then replace the u with ax, and that gives us the first antiderivative. For the second one, we can substitute u for negative ax. This means du will be negative a dx, and dx will be du over negative a. Plug these in, then factor out the negative 1 over a. Again, the antiderivative of e to the u is e to the u. Replace the u with negative ax, and that gives us the second antiderivative. If we simplify this equation and solve for y, we finally have the solution to our problem. This is the equation of a catenary. Remember that the constant a in this equation represents the ratio of the density of the cable 
to the amount of horizontal force pulling at its vertex. We could have just as easily flipped that ratio and called it h over d. In that case, the equation would look like this, or this. What's surprising is that this can be represented by the hyperbolic cosine function. If we replace the angle theta with x over a, we get a times the hyperbolic cosine of x over a. This cleans up very nicely for something so natural. Let's see what happens as the value of a changes. You can see that as a approaches zero, the cable will begin to sag and droop in the middle, and the two ends will eventually come together. In reality, two cables, or two ends of the same cable, can never occupy the same space, so a will never actually get to zero. This is reflected in the equation, since a is in the denominator, and if you divide by zero, the universe will explode. As we go the other way, and a approaches infinity, the cable becomes very tight. Of course, every cable has mass, and that mass is affected by gravity. So in the real world, there will always be some amount of sag in the middle. It will never be perfectly straight. This also makes sense mathematically, since you can never get to infinity. There is no biggest number that you can plug into this equation. So there you have it, the equation of a catenary. Now the next time you pass a hanging power line, you can say to your friend, hey, look at that y equals a times the hyperbolic cosine of x over a. It looks like its a value is dangerously approaching zero. I hope no one gets electrocuted. <laughs>